there are still victims of this conflict. Let's talk uh, to Mayowa Akinsime, he's in a Nigerian, uh, who has a very interesting story to tell. Mayowa joins us, uh, I believe, from Hungary. Good morning to you, Mayowa. I saw you rubbing your eyes just before we came on. It's very, very early in the morning, isn't it? It is 10, 10 a.m. All right. Uh, I, I, was, I was telling our viewers that you have a very interesting story to tell. It's a story of extreme danger and now recovery. You were shot while trying to escape. You were shot, yes. So can you tell us a bit about that? And this is you now appearing. Uh, that means you got over that, and um, here you are. Yeah, I am. Okay, so it all started on Thursday morning. Actually, I was asleep when everything was going on. I'm a deep sleeper, so I, I didn't hear the explosions. I was woken up by my friend, um, a lady. She called me like, oh, I heard the explosions around your area. Are you okay? Are you good? I was, I was obviously, I was still sleepy, so I couldn't really catch what she was saying. I thought I was dreaming at some point. And I looked out my window, and people were running, and... I was confused. Where are they going? Why are you? Why are you running to? Like, where is everybody going? And I picked up my phone. I got messages from my dad and my mom. Oh, are you okay? And it said that is that was when it dawned on me. Like, this is something very serious because my parents are all the way in another country. So how do they know? And I realized it was everywhere on the news. Like, okay, the war had started and everything. It was it was traumatic. That morning was traumatic because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if to pick up my bag and just go with some random people that were running to God knows where. And I met a couple of black people and they took me in with them. Like, oh, don't stay alone because I lived alone then. And okay, don't stay alone, you know, come stay with us. And we in the afternoon decided to go into a bunker because everybody suggested that it was safe. And I'm not going to lie to you. I I didn't think I was going to make it out alive. I genuinely thought I was going to die because I started saying prayers of someone that was going to die soon. Like, oh, God, you know, please protect my family. Don't let anything happen, blah, blah, blah. And um, I heard, okay, you know, there's a curfew. Curfew was 10 p.m. So what happened that night was my friends and I decided to go back to our apartment, you know, charge our gadgets because... Obviously, there was nowhere to charge in the bunker. Charge our gadgets, you know, take a shower. If you can rest, you know, rest and everything. I could not rest because I did not feel safe. I mean, who would sleep listening to explosions, honestly? So I was able to charge my phone, my laptop and everything. We wanted, we planned to go back to the bunker around 9.20 because the coffee was by 10 and it was a 10 minute walk. So, you know, 9.30, we're back in the bunker, safe. The plan was in place, simple and nice. But around 9 p.m., <sighs> the explosion seemed like, I felt like it was my building that was getting exploded because it, it just seemed too close. So I called them because the apartment, they are, their own apartment building was next to mine and I wasn't near them. I was alone in my house. So I called them, okay, please, let's start going now. I don't want to wait till 9.20 because it seems like this is getting closer. I don't know what to do. And said, okay, fine, don't be scared. Okay, we're coming outside now. And I had a box with me. I thought it was gonna last a few days, honestly. Because I was, I was just confident, like, a war, how deep could this really be? I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to be like this. And when I got outside that night, I met up with them. And the next thing we heard was a gunshot. Obviously, we were, we were, we were scared because, okay, who, who could be shooting at this point in time? And then it was dark. It was very dark. We couldn't see anything. We just heard a gunshot. And there was this man. I know he's a man because I heard his voice. He was cussing at us in Ukrainian. You know, he called me a he called me the B word in Ukrainian and he was chasing and shooting at us. We were confused, but we would not wait to figure out why he was doing that. We started running. Now I had my box with me. It was like, oh, do I leave my box or do I just keep running? Am I gonna die? Um, there's this thing I saw, like when someone's shooting at you, you run in a zigzag motion. So it, it's like there's a less chance of the bullet hitting you. Nothing was coming to my head. I just knew that I had to run. And my life flashed before my eyes. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to make it out alive. And when I stopped hearing the bullets, I thought I thought I was dead. I, I, I thought I was dead. But then all of a sudden, we couldn't find him anymore. And we ran back like into the bunker. And what was on my mind at this point was, I'm sorry. 
I get it. I, un I understand. Relieving, relieving it is very, very difficult. This is a death experience you're relating. Um, I understand. I understand. Please go on. Okay. Um, what I was thinking about, I started thinking less of myself at this point. I'm thinking more of my family, you know, because I, I couldn't even really get my phone to charge. So my phone kept dying. And I was putting myself in my parents' shoes. You know, if you're trying to reach your daughter out in Ukraine and she's not picking up your call, she can't respond to your text. You're not going to think, oh, her phone died. You're going to think this girl is no longer breathing. So I had to look for a way to, I bought a power bank from one of my friends. And when I got back into the bunker, I was shaking. I mean, we were all shaken because our lives literally just flashed before our eyes. And at that instant, I genuinely just, I just didn't think that I was going to be alive anymore. I, I started making, I started writing letters to my, I wrote a letter to my dad. I wrote a letter to my mom. I wrote a letter to my siblings. Just so, just because I didn't think I was going to be alive. And we spent like the next two days in the bunker and um, a particular morning, I decided, okay, you know what? I'm going to leave this place. It doesn't even, it doesn't feel safe here. I'm going to leave. And um, that morning, I had to talk to my parents first because I wouldn't leave without telling them. So I texted my parents. <clears throat> okay, that mom, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'll go to the railway station and. Um, just to take any train going anywhere. I was I planned to go to the Poland border because that was the first one to open, and a lot of people were going there. So I told them it was not it was not a really nice conversation with my parents because they were worried, understandably. And my dad said he said, "Look, I don't want to lose you. Uh, if you don't mind staying on the ground, this will probably die down in a few days." I'm like, but that's what they show you on the news. That's what they make it seem like, like it's nothing serious, like it's not that deep. But that I've seen smoke, I've seen the building go up in flames right close to my building, and I'm not about to risk this. It was not a pleasant conversation, but they, they let me go. And um, on the train, I heard people were dying at the Poland border. I had a group mate of mine who was there for two to three days, no food, no water. Apparently, they weren't just letting them go. And I was on the train listening to all this. Mind you, on the train, I stood for about over 20-something hours. And some people were fighting. It was not, everybody was on their worst behavior. Understandably, survival instincts kicked in. Nobody was trying to be you know, nice to anybody at this point. We're all trying to be safe. And I understood that, but it was not a nice environment to be in that train because for one, I was close to the window and the thoughts I had were, okay, so now if anything happens, I'm going to be the first to die because I'm close to the window. My thoughts were not good. They were very negative, I hate to say, but they were very negative. Like I said, I did not think I was going to make it. I held on to my letters. I made sure they were like in my pocket next to me. So just in case I die and someone, maybe they try to get my body, they can just find my letters and give to my parents somehow but I wouldn't let my parents see this each time I spoke to them I was you know I was happy you know I was just like oh I'm alive you know hey like so me I'm okay I'm, I'm good but it wasn't like that it was it was traumatizing and for 20 something hours I wasn't sure if we're going to come across like maybe a Russian the Russian army maybe they're going to bomb the train like you know it was I don't think I was going to be you know, now, when, now, when you are on your way to the Polish border, I just want to clear some things. You are on your way to the Polish border. So how did you then get across to Hungary and knowing fully well, when you were talking earlier about um, being shot at, you, were you actually hit? No, I wasn't hit. Good. So you escaped that. But you had all these morbid thoughts with you on the train uh, out of Ukraine. Uh, and at that time, you believed you were going to Poland. So how did you end up in Hungary? OK, so the plan was to go to Lviv and then find a bus to take me to the, um, take me and some of my friends were with me to take us to the Polish border or on the train on the train ride to Lviv, it was a very long ride. So um, getting the updates from people that were at the Poland border, I decided to change my destination. And I told my parents about this. And I, they were, you know, they were confused, like, my, what this thing you're doing is not 
it's not safe. Like, why are you? Uh, when I told him I was going to the college for that, they already started um, researching, you know, they said, oh, there are some government officials waiting to take you people in, you know, being very good parents as, as they should. And when I told them, okay, you know what, I'm not going to Poland anymore, I'm going to Hungary because I'm hearing people are dying in Poland and um, I'm not about to die. It was not, it was also my nice conversation because I mean, you say you're going to Poland, so why are you going to Hungary now? How safe is Hungary? Who is there to take you in? Uh, you with your friends? Okay. And then when we got to Libya, I was with a couple, thank God for my friends because if I did this alone, I would have probably got some loss. I'm not good at direction. So I really thank God for my friends that were with me. I had like three of them with me then. So we all decided to go to to Hungary instead of Poland. So when we got to Lviv, we had to wait a couple hours to find a bus. There was one of them that was with us that I really don't know how he got this bus. It was a very big bus that I rode for. It was a very long ride too. But when I was asleep on the bus, and then when I woke up, we said we were close to the to the Hungarian border. I'm like, how? How come? You know? And it was that's the one thing that I'm going to keep thanking God for, because I've heard stories that, you know, some people got lost, they didn't know where they were going, the train had to come back, but it just seemed smooth. The only part that was not really smooth was the train ride to Lviv, because when I heard, especially when I heard that we were at Kiev, and we were at Kiev for a very long time, because I was checking my phone, I was using Snapchat, the geolocation to check. Like, why am I still seeing Kiev? Like, the things I'm hearing about Kiev, they are not nice. And I heard earlier that a train had to go back because some, the railway was exploded. So it was, it was, it was, it was, it was not a smooth fight because we were, at some point, I thought the driver was confused because we just, we just stopped. Like, why, why did the train stop? I was very scared to look out the window, like, okay, is this where we'll all die? And, but we, we didn't die. Thank God for that. When we got to the Hungarian border, they were actually really, they were, were really nice. There was no, no case of, you know, okay, we're not going to let you in and everything. I did not have my post-bit card. post card is a temporary residence permit that we get in Ukraine. I, the one I had with me was expired, and my main one was at the office. I was supposed to get it that Thursday morning, but I couldn't because of the whole thing. And I thought, okay, like, am I going to be stranded here? Are they going to just keep me? But they were really welcoming and they checked the old one. I'm like, oh, sorry, I don't I don't have the new one. And I was let in. Now, when we're in this, I'll call it a camp for a couple hours. We were, give, we were given um, sandwiches, you know, apples, just, but I was still not at peace because I wanted to be in Budapest. And because I heard people were in Budapest, I mean, you know, Budapest is a city, that, you know, it's bubbly. So I wanted to be around people that were actually looking smiling because people that were at that camp, everybody looked depressed. And I was also depressed. I was not about to be around people like that. So when I finally got to Budapest, I thought, oh, everything was okay. You know, I'm finally safe. I didn't know that I was going to have PTSD because now every loud, till now, every loud bang seems like an explosion. I cannot, you can't just, I don't like people touching me now because it's like, are you about to harm me? Like I just flinch at every slight touch and things are still not the same. I wish I could say that, oh, I'm better now. Everything's perfect. Life is back to normal, but it's really not back to normal. And I still have nightmares and Seeing buildings that I'm familiar with on the news <laughs> burn down to ashes, it doesn't help. And I still don't feel safe. I don't know why, because I'm no longer there. I should be okay, but I just, I still don't feel safe. Some of the doctors would tell you that that is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, otherwise known as PTSD. But I, I, I want to talk to you about what is going on with you now in Hungary and what your plans are. But that'll be after this break, so stay with us, Maya, while we'll be right back. <music> Welcome back. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, uh, Maya Wa Akintimei, who is a Nigerian a young Nigerian student, uh, but whose story is both sad and now happier, uh, going by what we've been told, although she's still having some of the stresses uh, from uh, the traumatic part of that journey. Maiwa, thank you for uh, your time this morning. You are in Hungary now, safe, uh, a bit more comfortable than you were on that hair-raising journey uh, you know, 
But what are your plans now? I, I mean, have you seen the doctors? Uh, have you been uh, treated, um, seen, examined? And then what are your plans uh, for your education going forward now? Are you planning to stay on in Hungary, for example, or are you looking at opportunities elsewhere in Europe? Right. Um, when I got to Hungary, I actually do have a therapist now because um, there's this organization, Nido Nigerians and Diaspora, Nido Hungary. They've been quite helpful. They provided us with um, you know, essentials, you know, body cream, accommodation, food, anything that we wanted, we just had to ask them. So um, a couple of people came from the UK one time and it was supposed to be just like a random meeting, you know, explain what's going on, how can we help. And I got to speak with a sorry lady called Auntie Lola. So I asked for a therapist because I explained to her, you know, I really cannot get all of this out of my head. It feels like my breathing is exploding. Sometimes I'm just laying down and my bed just starts shaking. And then I realize my bed is not actually shaking. I'm just, it's just in, all in my head. And she organized a therapist for me. So now I do have a therapist that I see every Sunday. Um, 1 p.m. and it's my sessions have been going well. I've only had three sessions. Regarding education, um, I was there's this university in here that I'm very interested in. It's Semmel Wells University, and I reached out to them because I saw their you know um, school. I, I saw everything. The building was you know attractive. First of all, secondly, it's a medical school, and I'm a medical student, so why not? Um, I reached out to them. Now they gave me two options. It's either number one. I school with them temporarily until things get back to normal in Ukraine and then I can go back. Or I go back to Nigeria, which is my country, and then apply for a certain visa, like all the precedent and everything. So not knowing if I was going to continue schooling, um, you know, my school in Ukraine anytime soon, I decided to choose the temporary option. So I already went for the COVID test. I'll be going for the laboratory test soon. But um, I already continued school online with my school in Ukraine as Haki National Medical University. But keep in mind, I'm in my fourth year and this is supposed to be funny because um, one thing that really was encouraging for me while I was getting into this field was having to be in scrubs, having to see patients, you know, having to deliver good news to patients, having to, you know, insert in your catheter and everything. My dad is a medical doctor. Um, by the way, he's not a reason I'm doing medicine, by the way, because everybody's always asking, are you doing it because of it? No, I just, I personally have a passion for medicine. So um, watching him work, it's just so attractive. I want that. I want to be better than my dad. So being online, you know, isolated, just we wake up, zoom in, look at the teacher's face, talk to us, we respond. It's not the same. It doesn't feel like I'm doing medicine. And for the fact that I'm in fourth year, I was really looking forward to this year because I heard, you know, this year I'm going to get to, you know, feel like an actual doctor, but it doesn't feel like that anymore. It's, uh, it's isolated for one. Number two, I don't really assimilate things quite easily now because... Maybe, maybe it's the stress, but I'm very sure it being online definitely has something to do with it. It does not feel the same, but I don't think I will be studying at Semmelweis because there's no way I'm going to be able to combine two schools. The times are going to clash, so I just have to keep doing the online, um, having the online classes with my school in Ukraine, but it definitely does not feel the same. Um, my plan, I do want to finish this semester, at least. It's fourth year, second semester. Um, it's supposed to be my fifth year by September, but oh well. Um, I do plan to finish this semester with them, so at least I can get my transcripts and look, look at other schools, because as much as I do love my school and my teachers, online is not working for me. It's not for me. It's not for my type of person. It's not for my type of brain. I don't feel like a doctor. Just wake up, take things, attend present teacher, and so quite, it doesn't feel the same. I don't attend to patients, so I am looking at Samuel's University. But well, first of all, I have to consider their fees. This whole thing is not only stressful for we students, but our parents also. My my parents had to send me money, you know, to take care of myself. So now having it does seem as if. Uh... We're having a uh, difficulty with Mawa, but uh, okay, she, uh, I understand she's back. Mawa, can you conclude your statement? Uh, you were saying that, look, there's the problem with the fees and the cost to your parents as well. 
It does appear as if uh, indeed we do have, uh, but we've got the gist of that. Where I, and if my work can still hear me, we can only wish you the very best of uh, luck uh, there in Hungary. We will uh, try to get in touch with you again uh, quite soon to find out how you're faring. But we've been speaking with um, Mayowa Akintime, a Nigerian student, medical doctor in training, who was in, uh, uh, in uh, Ukraine and is now in Hungary. And thank her for her time.